you guys back. We missed you. We didn't miss your music, though. Because because your music was here. But we were, And we were glad. We really appreciate that effort. And good morning to all of you. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad that uh, we have a little bit of heat. And we're especially glad that we have air conditioning. It's nice to have you guys back. We have a number of prayer requests, three that are on the blue paper back there. They're not written in your bulletin. Karen's friend has COVID. His name is Jed York. Mar Winkleman and Don Stock will be having surgery tomorrow. That will be getting him ready for surgery later down the line. Be sure to keep him in prayer. Also for Taffy, Mary, Greg and Karen, Dorothy, Andy, Paul, Ron, John, Tia, Doug, Marilyn, Adam, Marsha, Mary Jo, Levi, Leah, Ashley, and Marsha. And any other prayer requests? You can stand if you're able. Sing and dance before the Lord. Praise, Praise God, God with the sound of music and dancing. Let every soul sing God's praises. Let the mountains tremble and the seas roar. Praise the King of glory, who guides our lives. Praise, Praise the, the Lord, Lord of hosts, who 
watches over us. Amen. You may be seated. It is such a blessing to be together in this place. As uh, as he said this morning, uh, it's such a blessing to have air conditioning. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for that on mornings like this. And uh, it is such a blessing to see each and every one of you. I'm going to take a moment to pray for you and pray for those who need to pray. Let's pray. Seated. Holy and gracious God, we are so grateful for you, for the blessings that you poured into our lives today. As we listen in this room to the sound of breathing, to the sound of air conditioning, to the sound of rustling papers, we are reminded that there is much life around us. Holy and gracious God, in busy days and busy weeks and busy months and busy years and in busy lives, remind us of the strength and the power that Sabbath rest will give us to take a moment to be still. In this stillness, fill us with your holy presence. Fill us with your spirit and power. Encourage us and guide us. Be with those who have asked for prayer that they could experience the courage and the love that comes from you. Gracious God, be with us. Let us be the vessel that goes forth in Jesus' strength and your most holy name. And the prayer that Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, our Father, Lord, forever. Amen. Friends, would you stand with me if you're able, and sing with me number 378, Amazing Grace. We'll sing the first, the second, and the last day. Seven, thirteen through 44 this is from the New International Version when a gentle south wind began to blow they saw their opportunity so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete before very long a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kuda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid 
they would run aground on the sandbars of Cyprus. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. The shipwreck. On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it 90 feet deep. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the last men stay with the ship. You cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time, untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship stuck, struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on the piece of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. This is the word of the Lord. It is true and can be trusted. I think we're talking about uh, Paul. Now, that's someone who, who gets a lot of airtime. Uh, for good reason. He's a significant character in the New Testament. He does a great deal. He writes a great deal. This time we're talking about Paul, but we're not talking about something written by Paul. We're looking at the Acts of the Apostles, uh, which was written by Luke. Actually, Luke and Acts are the same book of the Bible. When the canon was created, someone had the bright idea of cutting them in half because um, basically the, the, the short answer, the quick and dirty answer is uh, what, what makes a gospel is something very, very specific. And the last half of Luke is not a gospel. The first half is. And so to avoid putting Luke and Acts outside of the gospels, they cut it in half. So that the first half that talks about Jesus is in the gospels. And the second half that talks about the early Christian church is in the epistles. So we are in the second half of Luke, uh, the part that we call Acts. And uh, we're talking about the early Christian church, specifically Paul. Our story this morning takes place in the late 50s, not the late 1950s, just the late 50s as in 50 A.D., uh, Paul has a sense that God wants him to travel to Italy. That that's the next place for him on his journey. And as it turns out, he finds a way to Italy. It just, uh, just doesn't exactly happen the way he might have hoped. It's not a very efficient way of traveling, but it does get there. Here's the deal. Paul and the early Christians had one great debate, and those debates continue. There's a different debate just about every few years. But the first big debate in Christianity was whether or not a non-Jewish person could become a Christian. And so 
many, many, many of these Greek-speaking Gentiles in the Greek-speaking world in, in, the, in the Middle East and Asia uh, were interested in Christianity. They were interested in what Jesus had to offer. <clears throat> Paul and a few others felt that in order to accept that, then they had to convert to Judaism. Well, here's a problem. In the, in the first few years of Christianity, things were okay uh, between Christians and Jews. It was fine. But over time, conflict began to brew. And the conflict was primarily surrounding two different issues. One, uh, Rome had a list of allowable religions that had certain freedoms and privileges, including the freedom to worship. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, our First Amendment in the United States that gives anyone the ability to worship anything. In Rome, you had a list of explicitly allowed religions, and you weren't allowed to practice faith outside of that. That list also defined their religion, and it defined how they could worship and what they could do. Well, early Christians obviously wanted the freedom to worship and to celebrate, and so what they did was they told Romans, we're just a denomination within Judaism. We're just a sect of Judaism. We're Jews. We're Jewish. And that worked okay for a little while, but eventually, folks became concerned. If you are claiming the privileges that come with being Jewish, if you are claiming that freedom that Rome kind of gives you, they take it away a few years after this, but during this short period of history, they have that freedom. But, but you have no, we don't have any authority over you. You doing something that they think is subversive, because that's the quickest way to get off that approved religion list, is to do anything that makes you look like you're subversive to Rome, because the empire has to come first, right? The Caesar has to come first. And if your religion is in conflict with Caesar, it won't be allowed. Well, what if you do something like that? We can't reprimand you, we can't rebuke you, we can't stop you. And Rome doesn't care enough about us to make the distinction between you and the real Jews. So that was conflict number one. Conflict number two is that the vast majority of early Christians were Jewish. They were the first converts. And they didn't stop being Jewish. Jesus didn't stop being Jewish, so why should they? They continued to go to the synagogue. They continued to go to the temple. They continued to follow all the dietary laws. When they had a problem, they asked a rabbi, etc., etc., etc. And for a while that was okay, but very quickly there were conflicts. A group of Christians would walk into a synagogue to pray. And another group of people would say, because this fear existed, this anxiousness that that the Christians might jeopardize the freedoms, the limited freedoms that they had under the Roman occupation, they would say, well, what are you doing in here? And they'd say, well, I have every right to be here just as you do. My parents came here. My parents raised me here. Their parents raised them here. I have every right to be here. I'm as Jewish as you are. And they'd say, well, no, you're not. And then a fight would ensue. And I mean fist fights would ensue. They'd break out in the synagogues. Here's another thing. One of the freedoms that Rome granted to the Jews is that for the most part their soldiers stayed out of the synagogue. They stayed out of the temple. They respected those spaces. They didn't respect much else. They'd beat down your door and eat your food. They'd sleep in your bed and kick you under the ground. But they did respect the religious spaces. And by the way, uh, this is not an altruistic thing of Rome. This is a trying to prevent a war thing of Rome. They realized that if they left Judaism alone, that the people would be less motivated to fight back against the occupation. But if it was ever a problem, if, if the Jews were going to rise up and fight back, there'd be no reason to give them this freedom, right? Uh, hence the fear of, of being subversive. Well, what happens when a fist fight breaks out? Well, <clears throat> the Jews don't have their own police force. They don't have their own military. That's not how an occupation works. You can't be occupied by a foreign military if you're allowed to have your own military walk the streets, right? So the only police are the Roman soldiers. So they come into the temple. They come into the synagogue. Now, this fear that the Jews have was unfortunately completely warranted. Around 70 AD, eventually Rome would stop letting them worship and would destroy the temple and would no longer allow them the freedoms that they had when they were in Italy and other places of the world uh, because of these fights. These conflicts and these fights, uh, Rome saw them as a threat to peace, and so they just ended all of it. Christianity and Judaism both became illegal. So in this time period, there's all these conflicts and fights, and, and Paul is making it that much worse because he's bringing in Greek-speaking Gentiles into the synagogues. Now, it was absolutely permissible for someone to convert to Judaism. It didn't happen very often, and it was pretty difficult to do. Uh, Judaism is not a faith that evangelizes. Judaism is not a faith that goes out uh, and, uh, and intentionally tries to convert people. Judaism is a faith that if you want it, you can have it, but for the most part, they're not proselytizing door to door, uh, like Christianity does, for example. <clears throat> and so the idea that 
that Paul was proselytizing to these people. He was going to these people saying, you need God, and then bringing them in. That was problem number one. Problem number two is, of course, that he was only converting them to Judaism so that they could follow Jesus, and that seemed inauthentic. It seemed like it wasn't right. Um, and so those conflicts ensued, and ensued some more, and ensued some more, until finally it came to a point where there was a fight, a riot breaks out, Paul is arrested, and, uh, and they determined that he's broken a couple of laws. First off, in Rome, under the Roman laws, threatening peace, disturbing the peace, was a very serious crime. Right? We, have, we have disturbing the peace in America. It's a catch-all that law enforcement and prosecutors can use when they say, uh, I don't know if anything you did was illegal, but I don't like it. Uh, let the judge figure it out, right? Disturbing the peace. Uh, that existed in Rome, too, only you didn't have the protection of judges, and it tended to be dealt with much more severely because Rome's culture was everyone needs to get along, or else. This is a peaceful, pleasant country, or else, right? Uh, we will, uh, morale, uh, the, uh, like the old pirate joke, beatings will continue until morale improves, right? <clears throat> that was Rome. And so, uh, Paul had threatened the Roman peace. Paul had disturbed the peace. And when I say that, I don't want you to think of that as like the misdemeanor sense of today. That was a serious crime. Paul had disturbed the peace. Well, Paul's a lawyer. He's a good one, too. And he used to be a judge. And so Paul, uh, he begins to argue with them, and he begins to talk to these different leaders, and he finally appeals his case because he is a Roman citizen. Paul's a dual citizen. He is both Roman and Jewish. Most Jews were not Roman citizens, but some were. If they were well-connected, had the right families, they could become Roman citizens. He was a Roman citizen. That means that he had every right that a Roman citizen had, including appealing his case to Caesar. So... Paul has his ride to Italy. He has to stick with a guard the whole time. He's, uh, the way this would have worked is he would have been physically chained to a guard. Uh, a guard would take him and other prisoners, kind of like a chain gang type deal, and the guard would lock himself to it as well. And, uh, and there would be other soldiers around who would uh, be armed. And, and then here's the problem. It's after the Day of Atonement. So the Day of Atonement happens around the middle of September every year. So it's late September, maybe October. Any good sailor knows that the Day of Atonement is the last day of the year to leave port. After that, you run too much of a risk of running into a storm. If you've been paying attention, we've been talking about storms, you probably saw that one coming, right? So if you leave after the Day of Atonement, there's, you run the risk of running into a storm. But they find a grain ship that's leaving. And why is the grain ship leaving? Well, we learned all this in the third grade basic economics. What happens when supply gets constrained? without demand going down. And prices go up. We've seen a lot of that this past year. We've tried to buy a car or, or anything in the past year. You know, prices are way up because supply is down. <clears throat> and so these grain sellers figured out that, well, once the fall hits, no one is importing grain. The only grain they have is the grain they grow in Italy, and that's not enough. It's an urban culture. It needs to import food from other countries. So when it stops being imported, the prices go through the roof. And all winter long, grain is as expensive as gold. And so all you have to do is buy your grain from the farmer, put it on your ship, and chill out for a couple months. And then set sail somewhere around October. And it's risky. It's dangerous. Like most things in life, if you want the bigger profit, you have to take the bigger risk. But if you make it to Italy, you'll get paid really, really well for that grain that you would have been paid a lot less for two months prior. So they find a sea captain, and his plan is to follow the coastline. I, don't, I, I should have put a map up for you, but I didn't think about it. Um, but if you look at a map uh, between Turkey and Italy, that's where we're headed, you can basically follow the coast. You can follow yourself around uh, the Middle East and through Europe and, and Italy. You can basically get to Rome uh, almost the entire way without ever being further than eye distance, further than seeing distance from the shore. So the plan was to take the grain and to stop a lot, right? The plan was, uh, you know, like, like taking, my, taking my grandpa on a road trip. He's got to stop every 30 minutes or so, right? Uh, you stop often, and then if the rain starts coming, the wind starts blowing, the thunder starts booming, you tie off and you wait. You wait for it to pass, it goes through, you get back on, you sail for another few hours. It's a good plan. It's probably a plan that he did year after year after year, and it probably made him a lot of money. It's risky. Other sailors wouldn't have risked even doing that. But just to be clear, it wasn't reckless. It was just risky. Well, Paul tells him, I don't think you should sail till the spring. 
God says you shouldn't sail to the spring. And what happens in the Bible when someone says, God told me to do this, and you say, well, I'm going to do that, right? It always ends the same way. But Paul tells them, uh, you know, I don't think you should go. You should wait till the spring. And surprise, surprise, the soldier and the captain get together, and they say, a prisoner heading to trial where he could be executed doesn't want to go. And they say, well, we're going to go, right? They don't take it very seriously. They think he's just trying to get out of this. He's trying to buy this time. So they, they set sail. Well, here's the thing. It's a good plan. Stay close to shore. First sign of trouble, tie up. So these ships, these were grain ships. Passenger ships didn't really exist in the first century. Uh, all ships were cargo ships. And if you were a passenger on a ship, <clears throat> you were paying to ride on the floor at, on a cushion or a blanket or something, and that was what you had. And you probably were expected to do some work while you were on the boat. That's just how it worked. There was not enough demand for passenger travel between countries for there to be a passenger's ship industry, right? They didn't exist yet. So this is a grain ship. It's full of grain. It's about 150 feet long. And this is before sort of modern sailing techniques. So when I say modern sailing techniques, I mean like, you know, 12th century, 13th century stuff. Um, pretty crude stuff. Pretty crude ships. They weren't built particularly strong. Um, they didn't have particularly good sails. And one problem they had is that they had no ability to fly to, to sail into the wind. Uh, sailing ships built several hundred years later, they, they can't do it well, but they can do it. They can go forward in the wind. These ships can't do that. The wind has to be at their back. It's the only way they can sail. They don't have the pivots and the ways to move and, and manipulate their sails. So here's the plan. We're going to go from port to port to port. Well, this is the part of the plan we didn't think about is an unusual wind coming from a direction that it doesn't normally come at hurricane forces. And it just happens to be coming out of the port. At this point, a 250-foot ship or 150-foot ship, it is literally impossible for them to make port. They can't pull the sails up in row. That's not an option. They probably don't even have oars on the ship. It's too big. There's nothing they can do. They pull the sails up, they toss out the sea anchor, and they just wait. The only thing they can do is be at the mercy of the wind. It's going to drag them along. The, the, the water's too deep to get an anchor into the soil. They're not going to be able to stop. They're just going to try to keep the boat as slow as they can. And it continues. And it'll be okay. Storms happen. Tomorrow morning, it'll be sunny, we'll get, we'll get our bearings, we'll head back to shore. Tomorrow morning comes, it's still raining, still windy, it's still storming. Day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, day nine, on to day 14. By the way, one small detail. Uh, if you're driving to work, and it takes you 30 minutes to get to work, you don't pack a meal for the drive, do you? Of course not. Well, they didn't either. The plan was to go from port to port to port. So they didn't have food and water and provisions on the boat. This was not a, an ocean crossing. This was not a out to sea for three months uh, and, and, and waiting to see a pigeon. This is sailing along the coast all the way there, stopping frequently, sometimes two or three times a day. You eat when you stop, right? You get food when you stop. You, if the next port's two days away, you, you bring on two days worth of food, especially on a cargo ship where you want all your weight to be the cargo that you're going to sell in Italy, right? Uh, you don't want to fill the space up with food and water and provisions. So 14 days go by and no one has had a thing to eat because there's no food on the ship. Paul decides to speak. He gets up. And he says, I told you so. But this is actually kind of a cool I told you so because the thing is, Paul's not a sailor. He knows that. He's self-aware. Paul's a pretty arrogant guy, but he's self-aware enough to know that he's not a sailor. When he told them not to leave, he wasn't speaking from his years of experience with boats. He wasn't speaking from his trepidations about the weather. He wasn't even speaking from his knowledge, kind of common knowledge in those days, that sailing in the fall was dangerous. Paul was speaking on behalf of God, who told him that he should not be leaving until the spring. God had a timeline for Paul to get to Italy. What these sailors didn't quite realize is that that timeline wasn't going to be modified. Now, they could wait, or they could be made to wait, but they're not getting to Italy until the spring. Spoiler alert, they don't get to Italy until the spring. Paul tells them, you should have listened to me when we left Crete. I told you God said you wouldn't make it. 
What I want you to do now is keep moving. You're going to be okay. God said that I have to get to Italy, which means I'm fine. And God has graciously agreed that all of you will be fine too. The ship, it's gone. We're going to lose it. It's all going to be okay if you just keep moving. So they do. They keep moving for a while. Eventually, they start taking soundings. They realize they're getting shallower. Before we had the Bermuda Triangle, we had the Adriatic Sea. Sailors knew that boats disappeared on this water. Because it's full of little bitty islands. It's full of, of rocks and sandbars. There's all kinds of places to run aground and get stuck. All kinds of places for ships to hit rocks and sink. Or somehow even worse, there are stories of ships running onto sandbars and getting stuck and all the sailors starving to death on the boat. So the ship doesn't sink and sometime later someone comes along, maybe years later, and sees a ship in the distance and realizes that there's not a soul alive on it. And uh, they're just stuck on a sandbar for the rest of their lives. It's a scary place, but it's okay if you know what you're doing, right? Like a lot of things in life. Flying an airplane is scary, but pilots do it every day because they know what they're doing. It's a scary place unless you know what you're doing. But what happens when you lose the sun? What happens when you lose the stars and you have no idea where you are? Suddenly having good charts on board and knowing how to read them is useless. And as they're checking the depth, it's getting shallower and shallower and shallower. And all they can see in their mind is an island that's about to be their final resting place. So they throw four anchors out. The group of one group of sailors, they try to lower the lifeboat and take off. Paul tells the centurion, he tells the head of the soldiers, he says, if, if that guy, if those guys get off this boat, no one is going to live. If they stay, everyone's going to be okay. Centurion, by this time, has realized that Paul seems to have a sense of what he should do. So the centurion agrees, he pulls them off, they throw away the lifeboat. Some time goes, they eventually cut the ropes, and they end up at a beach. They drop the sail, and they sail right up onto the beach. The ship breaks up, they swim and ride planks all the way to shore. That's the end of our story so far, uh, at least for today. But I'll tell you the ending of the story. The place they landed was Malta. So they were supposed to go this way, they ended up going straight out. The wind blew them the dangerous way. The wind blew them the way that they didn't plan to go. And they ended up in Malta, west of Italy. I tell you, if God's got a storm in my life that's going to put me somewhere I wasn't expecting, Malta's not high on my list of worst places to be. Tropical islands, somewhere south of Europe, you know. It turns out they get there, and the rest of the sailors uh, tell them, uh, no. Uh, you're an idiot, but we're not. Uh, we're not going anywhere until the spring. So they waited out all winter long in Malta. Sure enough, Paul's going to get there in the spring, because that's when God said Paul was going to get there. And these folks didn't understand it at first, but no matter what, when, when God says, Paul, you're going to come to Italy in the spring, it was going to happen one way or another. When we reject God's plan A, we might end up in God's plan B. And let me tell you, friends, the first option God gives you is always going to be the best option. This is the thing that Jonah didn't understand. God's first option was to have him walk to Nineveh. He said no, so God's second option was to have him swim to Nineveh. God's first option is always the best option. We started with Jonah, who was in the wrong place. He was on an ocean he should never have been on. Then we went on to the disciples, who were exactly where they were supposed to be, but they failed to acknowledge the providence of God, and they were afraid when they didn't need to be. Now we're with Paul. He's exactly where he's supposed to be, sort of, but he's at the wrong time. And you know what happens in all three of these stories? In all three of these stories, they're going the wrong direction. In all three of these stories, they've been blown off course by a storm. And in all three of these stories, a moment appears where they finally trust God. And they get pointed in the right direction. In Paul's case, it's Malta. God delivers them to a populated island full of people, resources, food, supplies, and other ships to take them to Italy. Jonah <clears throat> was swallowed by the fish and taken to another landmass where he was able to continue on his journey. And the disciples, of course, eventually made their destination despite their fears. These stories are powerful reminders that God's redemptive act, ark, sometimes means changing course. Like Jonah, God had put a call on Paul not to set sail. In this case, Paul had no control over the matter. But it's a reminder that whether we're on the wrong course for our own doing or on the wrong course because of the actions of someone else, there's still time 
for a course correction. God can still use us, even on our present head. It's also a reminder that if God is calling us somewhere, we're going to get there eventually. Jonah, Jesus, and Paul all experienced this. We may resist and we may struggle, but we will eventually get us to where God is calling us to be. Where is God calling you and I? Jonah learned that running from God's call in our lives only leads to trouble. The disciples learned to trust God. To follow God's call in our lives can be tricky and scary, but if we go, we go with God's providence. Paul has taught nearly 300 men that if we're on a course that takes us where God wants us to go, we're going to get there in God's time. If we rush it, God's going to slow us down. Nevertheless, a course correction down the road is still better than that. This is one of the things that's so powerful in these stories for me. You know, we, we have the sense in our, in our lives that, that God has an idea for us, a plan for us, a, an outline for us. And so then we, we begin to imagine what does it mean to not be in compliance with that plan. We know that God has given us freedom. We know that God wants, uh, wants us to make the decision to follow God on our own. So where are we when God has a plan for our lives and we're not on the course? What happens when God's got a script for our lives and we're saying the wrong lines? It's tempting to believe that that just means we're lost, that it just means we're gone, that that, that, that that story of our lives is burned up and thrown away. It's so amazing about these stories. Stories of storms that occurred because people weren't where they were supposed to be, that occurred because they weren't when they were supposed to be, that occurred because they didn't have the faith it took to press onward, whatever it was, these storms were not their demise, they were the course correction. They brought them where they were supposed to be. The story that God had written for their lives, the plan that God had in their lives, it was amendable all along. It would have been better off if they'd stuck on the original course. God's first offer is your best offer. But it was still amendable still redeemable, because that's who God is. That's the crux of who God is. God is a redeemer. God takes things that are broken. God takes things that are going the wrong direction. God takes things that are in the midst of a storm, and God fixes them and heals them and puts them back together. By definition, if God's taking something broken, then that something is outside of where God wants it to be, but God brings it back to where it's supposed to be. It's the most essential truth of our faith. It's the whole reason we're here this morning, because we are people who are redeemed by God, no matter how far off we've gotten, whether because of our own doing or someone else's, we are people who are redeemed by God, who are put back together by God every single day. No matter what has caused us to roll up into the storms we find ourselves in, God is always present. God was present in each of these storms. God is present in the good and the bad of our lives today. God is calling you to weather the storms and press on. Who knows, it might take you a beautiful tropical island, or somewhere else entirely. If you go with God, you'll get there. Amen. Your friends in our offering plates are by the doors and we're in and out, and I'd like to take a moment to pray with you. Holy and gracious God, we are so grateful for the blessings that you pour out in our lives. God, be with us. Give us your peace, your courage, your hope, and your strength. Transform us, change us, build us, so that we might be everything you called us to be. Take these tithes and these offerings, this portion that we've earned with your help, as we give back to you from what you first gave us, and use them for the greatness of your kingdom here in this community. Friends, would you stand with me as we sing number 512, when the storms of life are raging.
Friends, go from this place in peace, and may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you today and every day. May the peace of Jesus Christ correct your course. May the peace of Jesus Christ calm the storms and allow you to claim the moments. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.